All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Bradley, and I'm the executive director of your Thunder Bay Museum. Thanks to all those who are joining us uh, in person and on Zoom this evening. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the original custodians of this land and paying our respects to the elders past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of Indigenous peoples. We also recognize that we are meeting on the traditional land of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, and to acknowledge the role of the Métis settlement in the development of our community. Uh, a bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a restroom just out uh, the door and on the right side just before you get to the elevator, as well as if that's full, there are some more down on our second floor. Um, Tonight, this lecture is being recorded. Um, for those of you joining online, we cannot see or hear you. So if you have comments to make, please do type those into the chat function and the question and answer function in the, in the edge of your Zoom window. Um, we're gonna have some interesting refreshments tonight. So that's my normal standard thing is please enjoy the refreshments, but uh, I think that's a bit of a special feature tonight. There will be time for questions and answers. Uh, after the, the lecture is complete. So if you are joining us online, again, do enter those into that question and answer feature. And for those of you joining us in person, please start jotting down your questions onto your note paper now. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by Lakehead University's Department of History. And I would like to also recognize some distinguished attendees at tonight's lecture. So please stand, give a wave or a woo um, if, uh, uh, if you would like. Um, and I apologize if I miss anyone. I, I can see around here there's a lot of other distinguished faces, so please forgive me. But joining us tonight is uh, Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society Board of Directors Treasurer, George Patterson, as well as our secretary, Dale Willis. And, uh, and away from any of our former board members joining us tonight. I see a few of you hiding. Okay. Also joining us tonight is Patrick Morash, General Manager of Fort William Historical Park. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> and Sean Patterson, the Fort William Historical Park Collections Team Leader. Oh, also woo. Also woo. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Our speaker tonight is Beverly Soloway. Beverly is part of Lakehead University's history department and has extensively investigated food ways during the Hudson's Bay Company's early years in the subarctic. She teaches Canadian history at Lakehead University and her interests include exploring how Canadians live within their time, place, and including roles played by society, gender, and food. Please join me in giving a warm welcome and round of applause for Beverly Soloway. Well, thank you all for coming to listen to me talk. Um, as a historian and as somebody who uh, teaches history as well, um, I love having a captive audience, right? So <laughs> don't try and sneak out. Right? <laughs> um, it, it's a, my husband is here tonight, and he's just relieved that he doesn't have to be the only one that listens to everything that I have to say. Right? <laughs> he's gotten rather used to all of this. He probably is going to be sitting back there reciting it along with me. <laughs> but our journey today is going to take us through 18th century Rupert's Land, and we're going to be taking a look at a few different things things as we get into our story and you're going to have to I, <laughs> I think we have some I may need um, assist, technological assistance here to get the slides there we go okay so there we go. So what we're going to look at is some of the foodstuffs that were available to the fur traders during the century. We want to also better understand the kitchen technology they had. So how they were preparing those meals that they were eating. And we want to see how those food supplies that we read about in the fur trade journals and in the Hudson Bay papers, how they turn those food supplies into actual meals. So we're going to start with looking at the people, the place, and the time that we are examining, right? So our focus again, the Hudson Bay Company and the fur traders in Rupert's Land uh, at the, from the end of the 17th century into the 18th century. So starting about 1670, the Hudson Bay Company comes into the far north and ending in around 1770, 1780, when the Hudson Bay Company finally moves off the coast and starts to move inland. The people that were coming into this territory as fur traders were dominated by Scots, a few Englishmen, but primarily those from the Orkney Islands. So this story is very much focused around the Orkney experience and what the Orcadian men ate at home and what did they do when they ended up in this new world and the food that they were eating. 
There were no European women in um, the, the far north, in the Hudson Bay Territories, until 1830. Uh, there were some Indigenous women that were used occasionally as cooks or laundresses or housekeepers, but they're far and few between. It wasn't a standard procedure, and it wasn't every post that did this. So they may appear here and there. By the time we get into the 19th century, that's a different story. But we're looking at the 18th century when there was most of the work was being done by the men that were coming over as fur traders as well. So for a hundred years, there are only those seven posts along the coast. And there are no inland posts, as I mentioned, until after 1770, when the Hudson Bay Company sort of woke up and realized that there were traders coming in from the south. And if they wanted to expand their business to keep their economy going, that they had to also move to inland. And that move inland changes the foodways of the Hudson Bay Company and their fur traders, right? So we're not going to look at that. That'll be another lecture, perhaps some other day, uh, because it's a huge territory when they start opening up and moving inland. It's a huge geography with different food opportunities, different climate for food, and different ways of accessing outside food as well. So we're looking at about a hundred year period here where food had to come from somewhere. So until 1770, we have about 200 men that are spread across those posts and usually somewhere between 20 to 40 men per post, right? Um, the fur trade journals and the Hudson Bay records just give lists of what the food manifests were, what they were sending over or what they were getting locally. So my interest became what's missing from those records, right? What did the men do with those foods? Were they eating similar to what they ate at home? Were they being influenced by local foods or local food waste? So to find out this, I've been spending considerable time looking outside those fur trade records, right? Reading about uh, 18th century foodways, both in Orkney and in London, in England, in Scotland, to, to try and understand what foodways the men were bringing with them into this new world they were living in. I also had to explore cookbooks and recipes, uh, cultural histories. I talked with people in Orkney about their food histories and their food heritage as well. And I think Fairly successful. At the end, I understand definitely much better how food sustained those connections between the Orkney men in the Hudson Bay Posts and their home worlds. And that's what I want to share with you today. So let's take a closer look at what I've discovered. Those fur trade posts never get self-sufficiency. 18th century London I figured they should be able to do that, but there's a lot of reasons that they don't end up doing it. In part, they're not prepared to be um, farmers, even though an agrarian society was dominant in, in Western society at the time. Um, they wouldn't have gone off to be fur traders if they liked being a farmer, right? So there's a reason that they weren't very um, well known as, as farmers. Um, and they were going into an environment that was different. In London, they thought, well, you know, it's about the same latitude. So, you know, like Churchill and New York factory should be similar to maybe like Orkney Island. But it was a real different area. And I've been actually in New York factory and I have been in Orkney, and they're not really the same <laughs> at all, right? So those men were going into an environment that was totally new to them, and to expect them to live in that Orcadian style wasn't going to happen, right? So what ends up happening is London realizes they have to import food. At first, it's just a beginning process. They figure, we'll start them off until they learn how to farm themselves, right? Doesn't happen. And so they constantly have to send in food. So let's look at some of those foods, right? The food that went in, went in once a year if the ships actually made it on an annual basis, and that food was expected to last a year. So some of the food that we're looking at, they're sending in enough to feed about 200 men, or what they think in London, 200 fur traders should be eating, right? So meat's going in in huge chunks. So if you think the last time you might have bought an eight pound roast, right? So they're sending in barrels and barrels of eight pounds of beef that's been salted and then stored in these, in these huge barrels. They're doing the same with pork. They're sending in big chunks of pork and you'll see there's pork listed and there's bacon listed. So pork is like you might think chunks of, of a pig, right? A flitch of bacon is actually when they smoke and they cure a pig and they cut the pig in half lengthwise, 
and they were packing those in chests. And we can see where it says on this one ship that goes to Albany, they're sending three ships contain three chests containing 20 flitches of bacon, about 850 pounds. So we think of bacon as what you have in the morning for your breakfast, but it's not. It's a term that was used in the 18th century, just meaning that smoke cured meat. So it looked like a half a pig smoked, which we would probably think was quite delicious too, right? So uh, we're assuming also that all of these goods are coming in in fair condition, um, wasn't mm. always the case. <laughs> they were sometimes poorly prepared. And sometimes they got wet on the voyage. And I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. So in this manifest, there were also grains. And some of the grains might be new to us today as well. Um, the idea of uh, malt and oatmeal, we sort of figured that. Uh, we see malt written and we see it sometimes written as barley. And it's basically the same thing. Just in a lot of cases, it depends how they're using it. Most of the grains are going in in a coarse uh, condition and they have on the manifest we see mills going in small mills so that they can grind it to whatever they want right so um, they would be sending in mar malt and barley um, oatmeal flour would be coarse ground flour unless it says on the manifest neat flour so neat flour is the flour we'd be familiar with like an all-purpose finer grind of flour right and that would be used more for your baking uh, fermity might be something that we're not familiar with, and that, that's what the picture is, right? And it's a coarse wheat grain that they would boil into like a gruel or like an oatmeal. And that is always, there's always barrels and casks of fermity that are going there all the time as well. On occasion, there uh, is Indian corn and rice on the manifest, which I think is quite interesting because I don't see either one of those goods ever listed as a trade good. So we know they're being used as foods, but there's very little mention of actually how they were cooking them. So my guess is they're cooking rice the basic way you cook rice, or they would make a pottage, which is like a big stew. So rice probably ended up in that. Indian corn, same thing, either in the pottage or cook it like a gruel, right? So similar to that. But they're not frequently, it's just on occasion. And Indian corn was the terminology used for what we would just call corn, because the term corn referred to any kind of grain. So they could have called all of this instead of saying grains like I do. They could have just called it corn, right? So they emphasize Indian corn, meaning that little yellow kernel that we're used to eating as well. Okay. Dried foods, of course, are very important. And they all, all this stuff is coming in casks and barrels. And I had to learn all these different new terminologies. Uh, it's uh, unbelievable the amount of different cask names that they have, depending upon the side, hogsheads and firkins and all kinds of things, right? So they would pack these barrels full of all these ingredients, right? And so dried goods, we have a lot of uh, dried foods that are going in. Raisins, prunes, and currants is an interesting one. Uh, prunes and currants we don't see as frequently as raisins. Raisins, we see tons and tons of raisins being sent over. So that bit got me curious about why they were sending so many raisins to find out that in the 18th century, raisins weren't very popular in Britain because raisins being a grape has a seed in it and they didn't, you had to seed your raisins. So think of that. You're making butter tarts and now you're taking all the seeds out of your raisins, right? So people didn't really like raisins that much. Hudson Bay Company likes sending cheap stuff that nobody liked <laughs> to Rupert's land, right? And it's not until the, 18th, the 19th century when they uh, get a machine that can de-seed raisins that raisins become popular in England, right? So they're getting the English leftovers that nobody wanted. Um, we also see garden seeds are really an important part of the shipments. They're constantly sending garden seeds, but there are lots of the times they're sending garden seeds that aren't very good. And so we see the different uh, factors are writing to their friends and saying, can you send me some good seeds from your garden? Uh, because the stuff the Hudson Bay Company said quite often didn't actually bring them any vegetables as well. Spices were important on that list as well. Uh, we see a lot of spices uh, being sent over. Um, and that gives you sort of a clue that they're not just sitting there eating bowls of stew all the time, right? They're, they've got these spices in large amounts for the quantity. If you're sending over, you know, a small cask of pepper, that's going to last you more than a year. 
Or you start to wonder, why are they sending a cask of cinnamon, right? Or three casks of dry mustard. So you know that it's really popular food ways that they're using them in something, right? So it's the matter becomes, what are they using them in, right? As far as dairy goes, it was interesting to discover that in the 17th century, butter was mostly uh, sheep butter. So it's not until we get into uh, the 18th century that we start to see cow's butter becoming really popular, and it's butter from Suffolk. Suffolk, England becomes the butter capital of England, and they're sending it everywhere out of, out of Suffolk. So it's not surprising Hudson Bay Company probably got a deal on it, right? So <laughs> they're sending butter from Suffolk, and they're sending what they called firkins, which were small casks, and they'd send 10 or 12 firkins of butter on a ship. Didn't always arrive clean or actually uh, in a healthy eating condition, but they were at least sending it, right? Cheese is interesting. Both Chester and Gloucester cheese were being sent. And um, I'm not surprised the Hudson Bay Company was sending this because at that time, the British Navy is also sending those cheeses on their ships. So it sort of makes sense. Hudson Bay Company had enough ins with people. That maybe they were getting leftover Navy cheese. I don't know. Or they were all in on the same deal. But they're sending the same cheeses as the British Navy is sending out at the same time. So it's rather interesting to see that. When I talked to people in Orkney and I was asking them, you know, like, what were you eating on your bannocks and your oat cakes? And I said, like, is jam, is that like a popular thing to put on bannock or, or on, you know, your, your oat cakes? And they're going like, no, we would never put jam on that. Uh, butter or cheese? And that was like it, butter or cheese. And they were like very adamant about the fact that cheese is important to go on your bannock, nothing else, or butter. Yeah, so you don't fool around with your bannock, right? <laughs> There were also miscellaneous provisions that were sent. Uh, lime juice, of course, by that time, uh, they are aware that lime juice will help with scurvy. So we see large amounts of lime juice going over. Uh, cooking oil is interesting because it usually said, like it would say Genoa oil or Florence oil. So we know they were getting that from Europe, from continental Europe as well. Uh, molasses is another interesting one that they're sending over. They're sending a huge number of casks of molasses. So again, why are they sending so many molasses? They are sending sugars. So you have this sweet component, right? So often we will, in our cooking, use molasses or brown sugar sort of for the same purpose, right? So I did a little investigation there. And of course, molasses is the byproduct of sugar production. And molasses then was sweeter then than it is now, but there was so much of it, especially as uh, Britain colonized the West Indies and the sugar industry grew rapidly, and there was so much molasses, everybody was shipping molasses, right? So it was very, very cheap. But a side story to that is that the several directors in the Hudson Bay Company were also part of the Royal African Society, right? The Royal African Company, rather, were a slave trading company. So the Royal African Company was taking slaves from Africa to the West Indies and then getting the cheap molasses and putting them back to the Hudson Bay Company back in England. The Hudson Bay Company has a huge amount of molasses because of this triangular trade. Right, so they have to do something with their molasses. That at the same time, Britain's introducing all kinds of taxes and laws about what you could and couldn't do with the molasses. The Hudson Bay Company owns the molasses because it's part of their triangular trade. So what do they do with it? Off it goes to Rupert's Land, right? So they're, they're, they're offloading another product, but it has sort of this, you know, little nasty history that goes with it as well. So it's rather interesting to see why they get so many molasses and they do use it in their cooking. They put it on their oatmeal. They put it on their oat cakes. They eat it that way as well as putting it into different baking as well. So in addition to all of these shipped manifested, uh, ingredient, uh, items, we also see local foods, right? That's the other important part of what's been uh, expected, right? And of course, they're going to do that because they can get fresh food. And they do depend upon Muskegawik people. Uh, Muskegawik, if you're not familiar with the term, was also the name, was the name chosen by Muskegawik peoples, whereas British people tended to call them Cree or Swampy Cree, right? So I use the term that they prefer, which is Muskegawik. So Muskegawik hunting supported the Hudson Bay Company. They predominantly hunted 
what they called deer, the Hudson Bay Company called deer, but was actually caribou, right? Uh, small game, some fish, a lot of geese. Sometimes they would come back with a thousand geese shot in one event. And the Hudson Bay Company gave Muskegawick a guns and ammunition. They actually recorded you know, how many guns and how many bullets they were given out, right? They kept records of all of that because all of their records have to go back to London to prove that we aren't wasting your stuff, right? And so they keep big track and they, they always have these, we had, you know, a thou our men came back with a thousand geese or 1200 geese, right? And then they would salt them and cask them and store them in a warehouse, right? And sometimes the Hudson Bay Company men, depending upon the time of the year, what other chores they had to do around the posts, accompanied the Meshkigawake people. Other times the Hudson Bay Company men went out on their own and they did, they, you'll see like the factor will be recording the activities for the day and they'll go two men out hunting rabbits, right? And so they were sending them out uh, rabbits, mostly rabbits of what they call partridge, which were actually ptarmigan, right? Um, but again, okay, those Orkney men weren't big farmers, but they also weren't big hunters, right? Uh, Orkney's not the land of hunting. And especially in the 18th century, if you have a gun and are going hunting in Orkney, you're not going to become a Hudson Bay guy. You're going to be a much higher up um, the social ladder, right? So it's sort of notorious that these guys go out hunting, but they're, they're really bad shots, right? So they only come back with maybe one or two rabbits or come back with nothing. They're, they're, they're terrible shots. Um, but interesting, I mean, they're good fishermen, right? They're pretty good, which is sort of explanatory to Orkney Islands fishing and the locks in Orkney. When I was in Orkney, I saw people fishing in the locks. So, you know, fishing was definitely better. They definitely had more success fishing. And quite often they would get 30, 40 fish at a time, no limits then as well, right? So and they had all these local resources. And I'll talk a bit in a few minutes about the plant foods that they gathered as well. Right? So we have a whole list of foods that they gathered uh, for wild foods. And it's interesting because everyone that writes in the journals, the various journals or logs, if they're traveling over there, are constantly writing what they see that's familiar to them. So we know this list that I have here are ones that are mentioned by Orkney, Scots, British men, what they recognize. And these are edible foods, even though we may be pulling them out of our gardens and chucking them in the compost. People were eating chickweed and purslane, right? Burdock, we hate that because it gets the little burrs on it that sticks to our clothing. They loved it, right? They actually shipped burdock from the Hudson Bay coast back to England. They eat the roots and they said the roots taste like asparagus. I'm going to have to try it one of these days when I see it coming up, but I don't know. <laughs> so it's interesting to see, right, all the different vegetables that they have that are available to them that they don't even have to plant for. They really liked dandelions, and you'll see repeated uh, mentions of dandelions often being the first greens that were available to them after the winter, and that, again, important if they're fighting scurvy. And Andrew Graham at York Factory wrote about collecting mushrooms, and he said they were gathered and eaten in the summer and tasted like European ones. So good on him. I don't know if I came from another country and saw mushrooms that might look like something we saw at home, how much of them that I would be eating. So good on him. And he lived at least long enough to write about it, right? So, so we know they were gathering mushrooms as well, which is you know, an, an interesting one that we don't hear an awful lot about. Berry gathering, very popular. Again, uh, men and indigenous women would often bring uh, <coughs> berry gathering and the, the wild plant gathering to them as well, right? And so some of them we're not familiar with around in Thunder Bay, like partridge berries and cloud berries are from the farther north. Dewberries, I haven't found dewberries around here, but I haven't really looked. I'm originally from Nikina, and I know as a kid, we used to pick dewberries all the time, so I know that they're there, but I know we have strawberries, raspberries, gooseberries, and cranberries around here as well. So they go all the way up to the far north, and they were familiar to the people um, from Britain, right? They were used to seeing those berries, and they gathered them, and they did eat them as well. Gardening, as I mentioned, uh, was an important part and London figured they were going to be having wonderful gardens. And people were actually confused for quite some time. Um, and I did a whole other paper on this. Uh, but they figured that gardening was not successful in the north because that's what the fur traders said. They just said, you know, our peas 
were not successful. But I took, uh, as part of my PhD work, I went and I actually investigated what was gardening success. And gardening success in the 18th century is not what us modern historians consider, right? So when you gardened in the 18th century, you went from the seed that you planted in the ground and you harvested at various times to get the sprouts or the leaves, right? All the way through the whole plant cycle, and then you let it flower to produce your seeds for next year. And that couldn't happen in the far north. Their gardening wasn't successful. It doesn't mean they didn't have vegetable seed. It just meant they didn't have the seeds for, last, for, for next year's crop. So they would have to write to London and say, send us more seeds. Our gardening wasn't successful. So I presented that at a conference a few years back, and I had some uh, bigger names than me historians there. And I was like, oh my God, what are they going to say? They are fur trade historians. And they, they talked to me after, and they said they never investigated that, right? They never looked to see what was meant by successful gardening. So that was my, my big moment was <laughs> to fully understand that whole garden process, right? That what we call success might not be what somebody else calls success. So they did have a lot of vegetables that, were, that they did have the opportunity to eat as well. In 1767, we have record of Humphrey Martin um, at the Albany Fort, and he is the first in the Hudson Bay records, at least, that actually had some success with potatoes. So he said they were small, but he had potatoes. And after 1767, we slowly see other posts trying that as well. The most successful gardening post was by far Moussigny. It was in a much more temperate climate than any of the other ones, and it was definitely more inland. By the late 18th century, most of the fir tree posts were growing potatoes, uh, but they were still growing more turnips than they were potatoes. At that time period, outside of those posts, even across Canada and Europe and the United States, <laughs> the Western world, turnips were uh, eaten more than potatoes. Potatoes still had it overlapped with, you know, beet turnips in the, in the race for starches, right? So it's not surprising that they were still planting more turnips than potatoes. That was just a pattern that was seen everywhere at that time as well. After 1770, like I said, we move inland, we have access to all kinds of other foods. We start to see by the time we get into like the 1790s, some of those other foods are starting to move to the coast, but they're being much more consumed by all those inland posts. So these aren't foods that are overly popular at the coastal posts because they're new to them, right? And you have to have that connection in order to be accessing those. So like I said, that's a whole other conversation about what inland posts were actually eating. Right? So let's take a look at kitchen technology, see what was happening in the fur trader's kitchen. The post records are really limited on this, right? Um, they don't talk a lot about the kitchens themselves, how they were laid out or cooking methods. I've seen uh, blueprints of the different posts that show where the cook rooms were. Um, but again, we don't get the fine details. So it's again, a lot of sleuthing to do to figure out exactly what was going on. And in the first posts, when the first posts are starting out, they're starting out with a, a small building that basically covered all their activities where they ate, they slept, they did their trade, they all also did uh, their cooking and their eating in this one building. But in every post, the same routine sort of happens that as the post is successful and as the men are sort of getting settled in that small building, they start to expand. And they, one of the first buildings that they build is a cook room, right? And in different <laughs> times, different places, that cook room gets replaced as well. So we see that in here. These are some posts that uh, I pulled out of some of the journals just where they mention, all they mention is that they have a cook room, that they have a cook room, right? Those cook rooms, when they actually built them, they were freestanding cook room buildings. The basement or the cellar was where they stored the beer, the beef, the pork, the butter, sort of like what you'd be putting in your fridge, right? And the ground floor was the kitchen where the food was cooked. Some posts, you might've eaten it there as well. Other posts had a dining room where they would have brought the food in, depended on the size of the post. Upstairs, or in the attic, it wasn't a full second floor, but it would have been a second floor to them, right? Sort of like a story and a half. Um, is where they would have kept the dry provisions. So bread, flour, peas, oatmeal, all those raisins, <laughs> the molasses, that's where they were storing them, was up there in that higher, drier uh, area up in the attic as well. 
Some of the posts designated specific cooks for the whole post. So it was one man's job. These weren't hired as cooks, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm presuming they were inept at a lot of different things, or maybe they cooked better than the other guy. Uh, but they become the post cooks from whatever reason. Nobody else wanted to do it. Who knows, right? Um, but they're not being hired in Orkney as a cook for a Hudson Bay post, right? Uh, the larger posts ate mess style, and that means uh, similar to on a ship, they break the men down into small groups of four, and food allocations were determined per mess. Now, again, we have variances according to the post. So some of the posts, the one cook, so if you had you know, 12 men at your post, that would be three messes. So you had enough food for three messes to cook for this meal, one cook, cooked it all, they ate it all, right? In other posts, the one mess, they took their food allowance and one of them, the mess four, would cook their food. So they would have three or four cooks at a time. It just depended on the post. And I guess who wanted to cook, right? I wish I was a fur trader. I would have been the cook, right? <laughs> no problem there. <laughs> so we also see that the chief factor in the off officers ate separate from the men and they always had their own cook. Right, so they always they had different food, better food. If a guy was a good cook, odds are that's who he was going to be cooking for, right? So the chief factor and officers definitely were eating well, uh, as well as or better than the men. Cooking was done over an open hearth, similar to what they would have been doing in Britain and in Orkney, right? They were had open fires, and that's how they cooked. Um, ovens. We have records from 1670 that they built an oven, an outdoor oven. Except they also found out very quickly that outdoor ovens weren't very good in the far north because it was a summer oven, basically. It wasn't going to work in the middle of the winter. And so one of the first things that they do when they start you know, improving their situation is to start building uh, an indoor one. And the picture on the top left there shows that little black door there uh, where they would have had an oven as part of their fireplace. And we know that they had an oven because they talk about it, as well as on the ship's manifests, there are oven doors being sent over. So we know that they had those kinds of ovens as well. By the 1740s, some of the posts are putting in uh, what they were calling large brick stoves, which is like the one on the bottom, right? And they were much more enclosed than an open fireplace because the problem with the fireplace, if any of you have a fireplace here in Thunder Bay, is a lot of cold air comes down that chimney. Right, so does it really work in Churchill <laughs> at minus 50 in the middle of the winter? And so the closed in stoves were popular in other parts of the world as well. I think they came out of France or something originally, right? Uh, but they start to build those kinds of stoves because it does contain the heat. But they would have one cook house had four of those going in the middle of the winter. I think it was Churchill that had four of those going just to try and keep the place warm as well as cooking their food in the winter. There were iron stoves on ships, which is really interesting because they talk in Churchill, they talk about a ship that had overwintered uh, in Churchill and they're getting ready. The ice is starting to break up. So they go onto the ship and they start lighting fires in the iron, ship, uh, iron stove on the ship, getting ready to sail out when the ice is gone. But they never bring those iron stoves into the fur trade posts. We don't see iron stoves in fur trade posts until the 19th century, which is rather interesting, right? Because because you would have thought that would have been a resolution. So they had the ship sitting in the harbor with the iron stove in it all winter long. And you know, you would have thought they would have dismantled it and brought it in for extra warmth, right? In addition to all the foodstuffs that were sent over, we see on the ship's inventories, cooking utensils, kitchen wares, all those things that they needed to cook. And that's an interesting thing to look at as well, because we see when we look at it that they are having more than just kettles and pots, right? So we know that they're cooking a certain kinds of food. If we can match all those foodstuffs that are available with them, we can match the types of dishes that they have and cooking utensils that they have. And then I will dive into the recipes of the era and the 
the food ways of Orkney or Britain, right? We can sort of piece together the possibilities of the foods that they would actually be making. And some of those dishes are sort of surprising to us that we wouldn't have think you'd be sending up salt trenchers or mustard. They're sending mustard pots and mustard casters and mustard. So mustard must have been like the condiment of the 18th century, right? Beat out ketchup. <laughs> ketchup was a whole different story at that time, right? So mustard was always there and that container, the mustard caster with the glass and spoon that's listed like that in the manifest is for table service, right? So it's rather interesting to think, you know, you don't think of the fur traders sitting up there on the cold coast of Hudson Bay eating mustard, right? <laughs> on their salt beef, right? So now that we have an idea of the provisions that were available and the facilities, let's think about what they were actually eating, right? Let's take a look at what those fur traders were eating. So we don't have a record, as I mentioned, of actual recipes. So I became a history sleuth and investigated, studying, as I mentioned, the food ways and the recipes and all those ingredients and everything. Okay. I do know that they were only having two meals a day, one at the start of the day and one at the end of the day. So even though they're calling the meal, the first meal of the day breakfast, it in no way resembled our breakfasts today. But it wasn't unusual for the breakfast they would have had if they were at home in Orkney, right? So people everywhere, breakfast was basically made up of leftovers from the night before. Either ones that were left to sort of cook slowly over your oven all night long, or in your fireplace all night long, right? Or they were uh, like a, a pot, like a oatmeal that would put a gruel type of thing, like, you know, that was cooking, simmering all night long. So you might have a pot of oatmeal ready for the morning. You would eat that, and the rest of your oatmeal would go into the pottage, the stew pot that was boiling, right? If you had a stew pot, it was normal across society at the time that you thinned it out for breakfast and you thickened it up for supper, right? So that's, you know, that was breakfast, right? So no bacon and eggs. By the way, I, I don't see eggs anywhere. There's no mention of eggs. There's no mention of chicken. They may have had wild eggs, but if they did, there's never any mention of eggs of any sort. And I've gone through an awful lot of fur trade journals and I have not. Looking specifically for eggs and chickens, that's a 19th century thing, right? We start to see more of that. That's a newfangled fur trade thing. Supper is a lot of meat. They would often have meat from every category, right? Uh, local wild game was their first choice of meat, and then they saved the salted meat, usually for special occasion, or they ran out of all the fresh meat, right? Um, most frequent, as I mentioned, is that pottage, that stew, where it would be meat and grains, and it was just constantly added to and added to and added to. God knows how old it was by the time they finally started a new pot, right? And again, as I mentioned, familiar dish across um, Europe as well. For fowl, uh, usually it was roasted, and uh, then it too ended up in the stew and with everything else. First choice again, fresh. Second choice would be anything that was salted. The problem with the salted geese is there is no inventory system in the Hudson Bay Company warehouses. So they are basically shooting those thousand geese, stripping them down, salting them, putting them in a barrel, sealing it up and throwing it in the warehouse. Now it's time to eat them. We just go get a barrel of geese. Maybe it's one from this year. Maybe it's one from four years ago. We don't know until we open it what the surprise is going to be. So there are a lot of accounts of them opening barrels of spoiled geese. And you can just imagine... I, did, I didn't bring any geese, by the way, tonight. Uh, so you can well imagine what salted geese, four years old, that had gone rancid in a barrel would actually be like when you opened it, right? So um, that was a big problem. I don't know at what point. I'm guessing, again, the 19th century, they learned an inventory system and <laughs> eradicated that problem. Fish is interesting, too, because fish was preferred fried. Why not? Uh, and the, the first way that they ate fish was to but cook it in butter. If it was fresh fish, they cooked it in butter. If it was dried or salted fish, they cooked it in oil, right? So yeah, wouldn't you like to have the fresh fish? Three pounds of fish fried in butter per man a day, right? In addition to the, your meat and your fowl. Right? So, so yeah, you could eat two meals a day. You didn't need lunch at that time, right? Proteins, of course, were always accompanied by another food. Uh, we see dried beans and peas 
which were called collectively peas, spelt like with the E on the end, um, eaten. So you would find the peas and beans in a pottage or maybe as a gruel. Um, grains are similar into the pottage as a gruel, right? Um, they could get very tired of that, especially in the winter. You hear a lot of complaining about whatever the dried was or the grains that they were eating as well. Um, the plant foods are rather interesting as well because not only did they add like the, the roots to pottage, um, but they boiled the turnip tops, they boiled spinach as a side dish. They loved to boil their vegetables. You don't have to boil spinach very long, but if you read recipes from the 18th century, they boiled spinach, they boiled lettuce, but lettuce wasn't like our lettuce. It was a tougher, more hearty lettuce, but they still, they made a boiled salad of lettuce. Uh, and then they'd put vinegar on it, and then sometimes they would put raisins in it. So it's like, there's one for lunch tomorrow, right? <laughs> Uh, cold salads, obviously what was gathered and gardened was going into those as well, right? So like I said, boiled salads, I, that's one I'm going to pass on. The most prolific vegetable, again, turnips, so we see it showing up. The turnip isn't a turnip, the true turnip, the white, it's the yellow, what was called, we call a rutabaga, right? That's the turnips that they were growing because they were hardy in the north as well. The interesting one that comes up there is pickles. And uh, when I started seeing pickles on the manifest, I'm going, pickles? They were sending them pickles. What were they sending them? And then I come across uh, cases where when they're listing what all the men are doing, you know, two men are digging the garden and one man's out hunting the rabbits and two men are making pickles. And I'm seeing this like over and over and over again. And I'm trying to think, well, what are they making? They don't have what we call a pickle, which is usually cucumbers, right? So exactly what are they pickling? And I'm looking at the dates and it's usually in May and June. So we think of the far north in May and June. It's not like Thunder Bay in May and June, right? So you're just getting your first greens coming through. So I started doing a lot of investigation of, well, what were they familiar with? What was it that they were pickling that they would have been familiar with from their home world that they found in their new world that they could turn into pickles? And I discovered that in Britain, pickling was really important because A, no refrigeration, and B, we have to have green stuff in the winter. So pickling was really an answer to that. And so early wild plants were frequently pickled in Britain, in Scotland, in Orkney. It was something that everyone done and did, and uh, we know they were familiar with the plants that they saw. And so I've actually found recipes for all four of those where you could actually modern day recipes where you could still pickle them. So when you're weeding your garden next spring, you can make pickles, right? <laughs> Do you want to or not? I don't know. But I'm really tempted now to try like personally, it, it's you can supposedly get it still. Like it supposedly is like a really popular pickle in a lot of European countries. So I thought that was really interesting. And personally, and you see it all the time in the summer if you're familiar with gardening at all. So um, it's <laughs> that one I may try next year as well. So interesting to see how they use their found produce, right, it, to make something that would give them the benefit of a green vegetable during the winter. I never thought the fur traders were making pickles, right? Bread, of course, they were making. Bread's probably the most familiar story for any of us when we talk about the fur trade. Uh, but we all think that yeast isn't being shipped by the Hudson Bay Company, at least, until the 19th century. So most of the yeast is from the beer making process. Um, that yeasty foam waste from uh, the fermenting grain is uh, skimmed off. And they're making, then they're adding flour and sugar and then using that uh, to make the bread, right? So they are making beer. There are mentions throughout the journals of so many men making beer, right? Uh, so we know they have the beer making, we know they have the malt and the barley to do it, so, and they have sugar, so they have all the ingredients necessary to make their own yeast, and that's what they do. Um, so they're making multiple loaves a week when they make it, <laughs> except there's an awful lot of Orcadians there and not of very many Englishmen. And it's the Englishmen that want the bread and the Orcadians want their bannock, right? So they would make like a whole oven full of bread and then they would just literally stack it in the corner of the cookroom, right? And that was like the bread for the week. And once a week, they would just make these huge ovens full of bread. The rest of the time they were making bannock. That was the bread of choice for anybody in Orkney. Still is in Orkney today. We were in a, a grocery store and uh, it was the grocery store was probably, the aisle was probably like this 
the width of this, of this room. And it was like five racks of bannock, and on the bottom was loaves of bread. So that's still, that's still today. And that's exactly, you know, mirrors what was happening in Orkney, right? They were making bannock. And the ingredients for bannock, of course, are all imported. They had those imported. They could make bannock. What they couldn't do was make Orkney bannock, where they used beer, spelt B-E-R-E, -E, barley, which was a special barley that was grown only in Orkney. Right? We actually were at a beer mill and we saw them grinding. And they still have a beer mill that grinds in the old fashioned way, right? So if you go to Orkney, you can see them make it and you can taste that. And you can only get it in Orkney, and I tried. I tried Amazon, I tried everywhere to try and get some beer barley, so I would have made Bannock if I had found it, because it's really hard uh, to find beer barley here in Canada. We can't get it, right? So, and they make such a limited supply, that's why. Baked goods, of course. Everybody liked uh, their sweet treats, including <laughs> fur traders, right? So uh, we've seen the ingredients. They had the ingredients to do it. As I mentioned, there's no mention of eggs. So we don't really know what they were using. If they were making eggless dishes or were they using wild eggs when they needed uh, to have eggs? We know they knew where to find geese and duck. So we know that they would have had access to wild eggs at least once a year, right? Uh, we see records of puddings being made. They had pudding basins. So pudding uh, uh, may, could be referred to as a dessert, but in more often than not, they were making like the steamed puddings, you know, like the Christmas puddings. Those were being made. And we know they were using prunes and raisins and currants and making those as well. Uh, we know tarts were being made. There's records of them making tarts. But a tart in the 18th century isn't those nice little things that we eat today. They were like a pie without a lid. Uh, records of pies being made, of course, that's with the lid. Prior to the 18th century, you wouldn't have had your pie made in a pie pan. You would have had this really tough, tough crust called a coffin, and uh, you wouldn't have eaten the crust, right? So that was like your baking vessel is what it was. But with your groceries being imported, you're not wasting your your pastry ingredients to make a, a coffin crust, right? You're making what we would recognize as a pie. And they were doing that everywhere by the 18th century as well. We have records of pie making being events. Um, as one fur trader recorded, one pie making event at Churchill, a physical fight between men and the chief cook broke out because the men kept opening the oven doors to check on their pies. And this was ruining the, chi the chef's bread. So, so we know they were making pies, right? Uh, another interesting um, food that was very familiar to people in Orkney is Bruni. And this is an Orkney special. It's an oatmeal gingerbread. Uh, they would usually put butter on the slices, uh, baked in that oven or in the oven kettles right on the hearth. And they had all the ingredients to make it. It's very basic, right? With molasses and flour and basically oatmeal and a little bit of ginger. If they wanted to put raisins in, they probably could have did that as well, right? <laughs> Oat cakes and shortbread were another thing that was part of their everyday life in Orkney, and they were came in handy in the in the north as well because they were basic ingredients, right? That they were made from. They kept very well. They could take them with them when they were traveling if they were going from post to post or going out hunting. They could take them with them, right? They traveled very well as well. Oat cakes were generally eaten um, with butter on the top or topped with savory toppings which I didn't bring any of those because I didn't know how you'd appreciate herrings, sardines, or cheese on your oat cakes, right? They also dipped their oat cakes in their pottage in the broth as well, right? So I guess after the oat cakes had been around for a while, dipping it in the broth helped them a lot too, right? There were special meals. Um, we have records of different celebrations and they would break out more food uh, for the men. Um, we see like Christmas, New Year's, Easter, royal events. If a new king got crowned or there was a baby born, by the time the news got back to the people in Hudson Bay, they had a reason for a party, right? And they would break out some more food. And here we have one example of what was happening on Christmas Eve. Now, this is for every four men, right, at York is getting this. So every format. Let's just hope they open the right cask of geese, right? <laughs> so that's a lot of that's a lot of coal words are like a cabbage, right? So they're, they're, the four men, depending upon their post, if you have one chef that does it all, so depending on, for every four men, so if you multiply that times however many men, and they're going to cook all of that, right? 
So they can be roasting the beef, roasting the geese, maybe making stews with them as well because they got pork and hair and beef and geese so they can have roasted and fried and, you know, you name it, they can do it, right? So they got flour and fat and butter. Fruit, the, the three pounds and a half of fruit is like raisins, prunes, or currants, right? So, you know, and some spice. So they're making something like a Christmas pudding, yeah. right? With it, they're going to make a steamed pudding. And a good dish of colwort. So in other words, they're having a big dish of cabbage to go with all of that. Wow. Just to keep that indigestion going, right? <laughs> Not all food experiences, of course, were actually good ones. And the Hudson Bay Company, as I have mentioned, sent a lot of cheap food, a lot of poor quality food. A lot of it went bad on the voyages as well. Um, butter was often rancid or actually dirty. Can you imagine getting dirty butter? Um, flour barrels were often reported that they were being cheated out of the flour because they put sand in the bottom and then they just topped it with flour. Uh, Poor quality grain, so people again took advantage of that and they would, you know, they had an order for so many things of barley and they were still husks on them and they had to be all clean and you weren't getting as much as what you actually thought you were getting. So the quality was really poor. Uh, meat was often rancid or rotten. Sometimes it wasn't salted properly. Sometimes it got wet on the ships. And so by the time they opened it, whatever that was, because remember, they're saving their salted meat for those special occasions. <laughs> and by the time they open it, it's gone bad as well. Um, Rupert Land, it's not just Hudson Bay Company's fault. Well, Rupert Land people were doing their own thing as well. Uh, poor food storage, as I mentioned, meant, of course, food loss. Um, inexperienced cooks, there's records of them cooking, overcooking food or undercooking food. One factor through all the partridges cooked for dinner out in the yard, calling them inedible, right? So think, and think of how much. So how many men, how many partridges? That wasn't like one partridge for four guys. It was like, you know, multiples, right, of, of these birds. And he called them inedible because they were all overcooked. Occasionally, no supply ship arrives. So there's no provisions for a year and you see them starting to run out. So they're trying to get more and more food. There's also problems because these are stationary posts. Indigenous peoples had been nomadic and are becoming what they were calling home guards. So they're becoming stationary around the post. So they are the resources, the natural resources around them are declining as well. And in the year when you have no ship coming in, there were cases of a lot of hunger, right? So they're down to we read in those years where they're down to rationing and they're they're literally going out every day looking for dandelions or weeds or see something's coming up through the snow because they have so little to eat. Frequently again, poor hunting, poor fishing. There's frequent mentions that there are no fish, there are no fish, there are no fish, right? And they were good fishermen at the time. So regardless of the realities of eating in Rupert's land, reports back to London were like this one, right? They frequently assumed, assured the Hudson Bay Company that their representatives in Rupert's land were dining in a manner that was socially and culturally acceptable to the Hudson Bay Company directors. <laughs> Hudson Bay Company directors would then go, why do we have to send you more stuff? You know, you're eating better than us, right? For most of the Orkney Hudson Bay Company servants, those new world, new foods were combined with their old world provisions and created for the most part foods that were familiar to them, right? Gave them a sustainable diet, albeit one that offered more protein to them than they would have had at home. And a lot of those men finished their five year term and turned around and went back because the, the protein access, right? All that meat that they were getting in Hudson Bay was way different than what they had in Orkney. So in that way, you know, that was sort of an attractive for them to go back as well. The success of the balanced diets that they were having is evident in post records. By the end of the 18th century, very few, if any, British fur traders were experiencing scur scurvy. So that in itself, compared to what we read in the early journals, compared to the late journals, tells you their diet is good enough, right? So they're happy. They're eating like princes, <laughs> and perchance you will have the opportunity to eat like prince and princesses. So what I did tonight was I made you some of those foods that would have been familiar to the people in Orkney that we can hazard a good guess because some of them they mentioned. And in other cases, we know they're familiar foods and they had all the ingredients, they had the tools, they had the ability to make them. They weren't difficult for them to make. So I did it. And I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs>
So I'll let uh, to see if Scott, do you want to moderate for questions or? Well, I, you could probably moderate the questions yourself, but uh, but I did want to remind our viewers online if you have questions, type, type them in so that we can read them aloud. Uh, so, before we start, you want to too Okay, questions, comments? Um, then, and then there. First of all, really enjoyed this. Thank really you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that. Um, when I was looking at the mustard, uh, and I know your thing is from a food point of view, but could some of that mustard have been used for medicinal purposes for mustard plasters? Definitely. Definitely, I think it was, because there are a lot of, there wasn't the same definition that we have, right? That this is medicinal and this is edible, right? And so they knew, they had the history of whatever they could do, get locally, whatever they could do to do something like that. So definitely. But the fact that they have, you know, mustard casters to put on your table tells you how much it's, you, you wouldn't be having that on your table. You could actually buy, if you were living like in England or something, you could buy a set that had a salt, a pepper, and a mustard. Yeah. yeah. So mustard was like a big thing, right? So I'm going to make my family eat mustard now. Tell them it's 18th century. Yes. Do you have a feel for what sort of general health these people have with all that food? By far, we don't see a lot. We'll see some cases of, of illness, but there's not a lot of record of it. Like I said, in the early journals in the 1670s, 1680s, when they're just sort of finding their way, that we see more cases of illness um, scurvy, um, other food related issues, right? Uh, that are, you know, teeth or something, right? Um, then we see later. So as we get into the 18th century, we see very little cases of, of things that just like we are today, right? You don't see like records. They had names for things like diabetes, right? But you don't see, you know, talking about sugar illness or whatever they called it. You don't see things like that, right? So they were, and like you said, we see scurvy talked about a lot. That's probably the most debilitating of all the diseases that, that people could get in that period, right? Especially ones that had traveled long distances. Some of them arrived with scurvy. And that constantly happens where they would talk about new men coming in that had scurvy, but they're healed, right? They're, once they are there and they're starting to eat what the forts are producing, they're eating much healthier. And we see that really drop off. Thank you. Yes. Um, I noticed that they uh, were given beer and wine and so on. Was any home brew produced in these places? Well, they made they made beer, right? They made small beer, so small beer being the weaker, and they shipped over strong beer, right? So they hoarded the strong beer for those special occasions, but they were making small beer. Small beer is a less alcoholic. It was more used as something to drink. There's not a lot of records of them drinking water. Like they didn't say, you know, we had a jug of water or so-and-so wanted to drink a water. We see them drinking small beer. The strong beer comes out. Um, the, the spirits that come over, they're usually listed like uh, French brandy. Um, they call, you know, Spanish wine. So they sort of had the country that they were coming from, right? So you could actually, if you wanted to go through all the journals, you could track, you know, where they were getting the best wines from, right? So, so they had... Uh, and, they, and they would also send over, there'd be like the whole manifest and there'd be like a cask of wine for Samuel Hearn at Churchill, right? Like a special one that was going for him, right? Or a special brandy that was going to so-and-so at York Factory, right? And it's interesting that they had like their names, like somebody was getting the special order, right? It wasn't just an ordinary Orkney man. He wasn't getting the brandy, but there'd be a cask going just for the factor, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe you can clear this up. Yeah. I've seen several places that dandelion was an invasive species brought by the Hudson's Bay Company. Is that true? No. No. Guess. It's a good story, though. But you hear it all the time. You think of it, right? Um, there's there's a lot of work has been done about invasive species, right? And how they get to places. And they regularly get to places ahead of Europeans. Uh, bumblebees, we often don't think of the honeybee. The honeybee is an invasive species. And the honeybee was brought to the American colonies. And by the time the Americans crossed the Appalachians, right, um, the honeybees were already there. And they were going like, ooh, there's honeybees here. But they were. They were going ahead of... The, of the migrants, right? Um, things like dandelion, right? So we have geese. We know they had geese, thousands and thousands of geese. Where do geese go when they leave the north? They're going south, right? So they're going into areas where dandelions 
that had been brought in as a garden plant, they were a garden plant, had escaped on their own. Geese were there, geese were flying north, geese were leaving, dandelion seeds, dandelions grow everywhere. We have a question from online. Uh, the first one is, is there any evidence of people on the post eating meat from the fur-bearing animals that produce pelts? Like beaver? Uh, so far, the wolf was never eaten by most people. Um, it it wouldn't be the starvation food to eat like wolf or fox or most of those fur-bearing animals. Beaver was eaten, um, but not on a regular basis by the Hudson Bay Company men. More often when they were with Indigenous people, if they were trapping or traveling or visiting with Indigenous people. So we don't have records of them bringing beaver meat. Once or twice, there's something, but it's very vague. We hear of it more from those that are going and are in communities where they did eat beaver meat, right? Uh, and then caribou, of course, they would have had the hides from the caribou, so-called deer, but uh, they ate those that they ate, right? Yep. The second question is, is there anywhere we can find your recipes for broomy <laughs> and oat cakes? I will have to uh, see what I can do about that. I do have recipes for those. Um, and I'm not sure, maybe Scott and I can have a discussion of being able to put them, I don't know, somewhere, someplace. Um, probably I would, if you go to the Culinary uh, Historians of Canada, I've had some people on that Facebook page ask me, so I probably will have them on that Facebook page. Um, I'll see if I can find someplace else to have them. If anybody wants any of the recipes, I have no problem sharing the recipes. So you too can eat like a fur trader. <laughs> yes. True that bannock came from Scotland. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not an indigenous food right. way because look at the ingredients in it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's basically flour, or in in, in um, Orkney, it's they're using barley, right? So it's basically a grain, yes. and it's fat, and then salt, right? So basically those ingredients in the original bannock. Now we put like baking powder and other stuff in it as well. Those are ingredients don't grow in North America. So wheat is an introduced crop. Right? There was fat, so they had fat sources available. But no, Bannock is uh, Scottish, it's Orkney. Orkney is really big in Bannock. And when we were in Orkney and I was mentioning that a lot of Canadians think that Bannock is an indigenous food, and then they were going like, oh, no, really? It's our food, right? So yeah, it's something that, that, that we don't know. Oh, no, uh, Scott. Uh, so another question from online. How would this fare compare to the meals in the Northwest Company posts at similar times? And that I can't answer, but maybe we have somebody here who can answer because the Northwest Company is going to have, their food supplies are coming from Montreal. So they're getting a different kind of food. They're also living in a more temperate area. They also have things like wild rice that I know was being provided for the Northwest Company. So I know the food resources are different for the Northwest Company, right? So they have a different base. They don't have to ship stuff from London. They are not getting one ship a year coming from London to bring in their, their imported goods, right? Uh, I don't know if, you, if there's anything... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so you were describing the Hudson's Bay Company once we get into the late 1780s and things changing from yes. the interior. I think that's probably a pretty good parallel to what the Northwesters were doing through most of their time. Uh, Dr. McLaughlin, who was the guy in charge of Fort William, uh, was a bit of a pioneer for gardening and farming. He grew wheat at, uh, mm -hmm. at Rainy River. Uh, and overall, probably a greater dependence on country fair, uh, especially west of Fort William. Uh, but I was chuckling to myself at the beginning when you were talking about the expectations in London of what the factors should be able to farm and grow at their forts. Uh, when the Hudson's Bay Company established its point of year on, uh, in this deck of the woods in 1817, they hadn't learned a damn thing in 150 <laughs> years uh, because their expectation was the same. Uh, why don't you have a garden? Uh, you're next to a giant lake. Why don't you catch fish? If you're hungry, go catch more fish. And uh, the, uh, the factors at the fort wrote these lovely uh, letters that basically said to their bosses, uh, sure, uh, we, we, we could fish, uh, but I've got six guys. <laughs> 
and we're trying to finish building the Ford and trade and build new news and do all the other things. And there being a significant disconnect of how much labor was required to farm and certainly to fish on Lake Superior, yeah. especially without any large vessels. And, and those directors sitting there in London, those HBC directors have zero idea. They're not farmers, like they're, they're England's elite, right? So they have no idea at all. And even when they can bring in uh, Montreal supplies, it's a different kind of a boat bringing them in, right? So you have the Montreal canoes bringing goods in versus a ship with cargo. Right, so you're limited to what's going to come from Montreal versus what London can send, good or bad, what they can send. Right, so it's it's an interesting comparison to see um, what they were doing in the more temperate regions. Right, and, and it wasn't like the man up in Hudson Bay were going like, oh, gee, if only we were in the south, because that was. They were coming from Orkney, from which itself it has very few trees, uh, but it is a, it's a struggling environment, right? So they were from one struggling environment to a different type of a struggling environment. The idea that you could have the rich farms of the South was not even on their radar, right? Yes? Uh, another one, if I may. Yes. Do, you have, do you know what the alcohol content of the so-called strong beer was? And was drunkenness or alcoholism a problem in, the, in those posts? It was, uh, and it wasn't necessarily from when they had the strong beer. And I don't know what the alcohol content was. I know that strong beer would have been more like the beer that we drink. It might have even been a little more potent. And uh, Gord, do you know if it, uh, what yeah, it was? The, um, uh, during the Victorian era, certainly, I can't vote for the 18th century, but in uh, Victorian England, strong beer came in at over 7%. It only went down to three and a half to four uh, in the 20th century because of uh, pressure from uh, temperance groups. Yeah. yeah, so we would have been, would have been, we would have probably enjoyed one of their strong beers. When we start hearing about incidents of alcoholism, there's the odd person that obviously has alcohol issues, not surprisingly, um, in any society. But it was usually after they had one of their Christmas or whatever their celebration, so and so in England had a baby and there's like a new monarch or something. And they would, you know, let loose the liquor, right? And then you would have stories about it or stories about how they were the next day, right? But there wasn't rampant, like, everyday alcoholism. And they did have a poor quality alcohol that they did save for trade, right? And so and when Indigenous people came to trade, they would give them... Um, some alcohol, not not lots, but some alcohol. And the other thing they were giving them like crazy was prunes. And I'm just thinking, like, it's always like, so and so and so and so came to the fort today, we gave them prunes. And I just go like, how many times can you like, we all know if you eat too many prunes, so it must have been a... Uh, I mean, Maybe prunes are good. Prunes are good, right? And it would have been a nice, sweet, dry treat, but... but there's, you know, the side effect of eating a lot of prunes, right? And, and I'm, again, just as the Hudson Bay Company sent the stuff to Rupert's Land that they didn't necessarily like, what happens in Rupert's Land is the Hudson Bay posts are then passing on what they don't necessarily like, right? Or the stuff that's starting to go bad, if something was starting to look a little off, they would give it away to Indigenous people, right? So it was just... You know, this, now, who do we? The indigenous people may have fed it to the wild animals or something too. We don't know what happened to it, but there's cases of you know that they opened this and it wasn't looking too good, so we gave it to so and so, right? <laughs> yeah. Would would they have used um, sticky cinnamon and those kinds of things like East Indian did for curry to prevent meat from going off? That's sort of a fallacy too, right? There's a sort of this fallacy that that in early times they coated all their, their bad meat with um, herbs and cinnamon and whatever else so that they couldn't taste it. But if you've ever had bad meat, you can't disguise it. Like it cannot be disguised, right? And there's other things they want to do to do that with, right? So that's there is sort of this fallacy about the role of spices. Spices, when you read about those those meals where they have like so many different spices, all those things from India, it's a show-off move. Look at me, how rich I am. Look at all the spices I have. You don't have as many spices as I have. Now I can make all these spicy dishes, right? And so they were using, that's where, why we see so many spices in those early menus, right? It's just being a big show-off, right? Because if you're poor and you can't afford to import all that stuff. Scott. <laughs> 
Uh, another common question from our uh, viewers online. I think BC Food History has a recipe for oat cakes. And this was too early for rhubarb, right? Um, rhubarb is also an imported from actually Russia. So it's a, it's where it's not an indigenous plant. So yeah, it's, we don't have rhubarb in the north yet. Yeah, so rhubarb comes in with settlers when we start to see settlers coming from Russia or in the, in the old uh, books, Siberia, uh, which meant anywhere in Russia, basically. But it was a Russian Eastern European crop that becomes brought over because with those settlers, right? Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, when, they mentioned, when you mentioned uh, salt beef and salt pork, I suppose you would have to rinse those off. They eh? must have had um, soak them for days. They would yeah, soak they them for literally days. Salt yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and just think, right? So they got the cask of roast pork or uh, of pork or beef, and they sat there for like eight months. And so the salt is even soaked in even more. Um, and now you've got to soak them for like two, three days to get and keep rinsing them out. So they knew how to do that. That was part of what they, they knew in part because that was a typical ship's food, right? So anybody that had traveled on ships or were part of Merchant Marine would have known, this is what you do. You have to soak it and soak it and soak it. And then you throw it in a stew pot more often than roasting it, right? So you would roast more um, the fresh, your fresh meat would be roast. So that, that pork and that salted beef um, into the stew pot and all those other leftovers. Are going to make it a lot more palatable, right? Mm -hmm. So does it make you hungry or what? Right? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. So I think it, that must be the end of the questions. So I know I'm the person standing between you all and the food. So I will try to be brief. Um, Beverly, I did want to give you a gift on behalf of the society. Oh. So there's a nice pen, a magnet, and a, and a lapel pen Thank for you. Thank you so much. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you for being here tonight. So as, as we come to the end of the program here, I want to remind all of you to visit the gift shop on your way out. Um, <laughs> there is a, our latest edition of Lake Superior to Rainy Lake uh, by Gene Morrison has just uh, come back from the printers. Um, and you'll notice on the cover, this is part of celebrating Fort William Historical Park's 50th anniversary. So, um, so do check out that. There's a copy up here for you to kind of peruse. Don't take it with you. Go buy one in the gift shop. Um, but I also want to point out that our uh, PA day camps are open for registration. So remind your friends and family to get their kids uh, on that list early and often. Um, I also want to point out our upcoming events on the calendar. So um, uh, this uh, we're coming up on Saturday, the 18th of November is our holiday market. And then our uh, next lecture series uh, event is on Tuesday, the 28th of November with Kelly Saxberg presenting a tale of two Qualanute. And then can I mention your thing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so this Sunday at 2 p.m., Sean Patterson will be presenting uh, Fur Trade Fort William, a chronologically, ugh, I can't speak tonight, a chronology of in art, 1805 to 1882. So uh, please, please to come to your house this Sunday, but I'll be doing it at the museum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so I wanted to say thank you to Lakehead University's Department of History for sponsoring this evening. And thank you all to the, uh, the museum staff and volunteers who make uh, events like this take uh, are successful, um, especially to Michael and Sarah hiding in the back there who made sure the technology is running and are taking care of our refreshments. Um, so again, we'll move on to the food next and uh, have a great rest of your night. <laughs>